I'm Peter Carter, Director of the Climate Emergency Institute in Canada. This is our presentation for the 15th International Conference on Climate Change Impacts and Responses. This first slide uh, sort of says it all. From 1750 up to 2021, this shows global CO2 emissions in the gray and atmospheric CO2 concentrations in the blue. Clearly, they are both accelerating and CO2 concentration is tracking very closely to CO2 emissions. And that's because, of course, global CO2 emissions are increasing the atmospheric CO2 faster and faster. So we'll look at greenhouse gas concentrations now first and then go to emissions. This shows atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations as the CO2 equivalent. CO2 equivalent is all the main greenhouse gases, CO2 and notably methane and nitrous oxide. This record runs from 1900 to 2021. It's very clear that the trajectory is accelerating up to the present time and has reached 516 parts per million. 1900, it was just over 300. Atmospheric CO2 equivalent, all the greenhouse gases, that's increased almost 70% since 1900. This shows atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations separately in detail. This is the long-term record from 1750 up to 2022 in this row. And here we have the recent record from 1980 up to March 2023. This is CO2 in the green and methane in the blue, nitrous oxide in the tan. Clearly from 1750 up to the present, all three have been following an accelerating increased trajectory. If we look at the recent term, the same applies. This goes from 1980 to 2023, as I say. Atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration is still increasing, and it has reached 420 parts per million. This is methane. You'll see that it plateaued around 2000, and then in 2006, it started increasing and has since been increasing at an accelerating rate. Particularly in just the past few years, it's increased at an explosive rate. It has now reached a concentration of 1,920 parts per billion, and that is from 1980 as well. This is the nitrous oxide record, which runs from 2000 to March of 2023. It's accelerating and is at a level of 333.5 parts per billion. To really get this into the extreme emergency perspective, we'll go back to the long-term record from 1750. So here is carbon dioxide, and its 800,000-year ice core limit is 300 parts per million, and it's now up to 420 parts per million. Its pre-industrial was 278 parts per million, so it has increased now over 50%. Methane at 1,920 parts per billion its 800,000 year ice core limit was 800 parts per billion, and its pre industrial level 722 parts per billion. So, atmospheric methane has increased 266%. Nitrous oxide, its 800,000 year ice core limit is 300 parts per billion, and its pre industrial 270, and it's substantially above the 800,000 year limit as well. Now, I must mention the big recent uh, increase in methane. This is from feedback methane emissions from warmed wetlands. So we have methane feedback. We also have nitrous oxide feedback. Nitrous oxide feedback emissions have uh, contributed to the increase in atmospheric nitrous oxide concentration. So all three of these atmospheric greenhouse gases are at record highs, and they're increasing at record high rates. Here's a carbon dioxide concentration, 1750 up to 2022. There's the 800,000 year ice core limit at 300. This rate of increase of atmospheric CO2 is absolutely unprecedented. The IPCC AR6 finds it's 10 times the rate in the past 800,000 years. So on to greenhouse gas emissions, global greenhouse gas emissions. Here we are looking at the record of global greenhouse gas emissions as CO2 equivalent again, and the record runs from 1850 to 2021. Over the course of this period, it's clear that global CO2 equivalent emissions have been following an accelerating trend. They have been pushed faster and faster. Uh, this little notch here is COVID. 
So by 2021, CO2 equivalent emissions had reached a record of 54.59 billion tonnes a year. According to all plans on energy and climate change, there will certainly be no reduction in emissions. And according to the huge amount of money that the fossil fuel industry has recently invested in new extraction of fossil fuels, emissions will continue to increase. So emissions are still increasing, yet they had to be decreasing by 2020. This has been established by the IPCC's last several reports and, of course, by the climate change science. Uh, here you see the mitigation emissions from the IPCC AR6 in CO2 equivalent, billion tons of CO2 per year. And this shows the two mitigation scenarios, the one for 1.9 degrees C by 2100 dark blue, and the one at 1.4 degrees C by 2100 light blue. In both cases, they decline by 2020. And as I say, this is nothing new. This was established years ago. This complicated slide, I'm just going to tell you the great importance of the finding from the Global Carbon Project of 2022 last year. This reported that climate change has substantially reduced the land and ocean carbon sink. The land and ocean carbon sinks have been buffering over 50% of our CO2 industrial age emissions. But the land sink has now reduced, been reduced by climate change, land sink by 17% and the ocean sink by 4%. So this is the CO2 fertilizing effect of the forests, the greening, and this is the climate change effect on those forests degrading. The green blue is sinking and the orange red is a source. So the carbon sinks are now sinking at a less efficient rate. Next is the oceans. The oceans are being subjected to these three escalating assaults that are all happening together. This is ocean heat content, this is ocean acidification, and this is ocean deoxygenation. They are all accelerating. Clearly the ocean heat content is right up to the present time. These are annual measurements. Also, the ocean acidification is clearly accelerating, and very clearly the ocean deoxygenation is accelerating. This is the ocean heat content in zetajoules. This is an annual research paper. This year, the title was Another Year of Record Heat for the Oceans. So this is from 1960 up to 2022. The scientists have estimated that the heat that's being put into the oceans by continued industrial greenhouse gas emissions amounts to the detonating of seven Hiroshima-sized atom bombs every second. This is not good for the oceans at all. And in particular, it's the main cause of ocean deoxygenation. And it's now contributing to extreme weather events on land. This is just to show the ocean acidification, how we derived the increasing ocean acidification from decreasing pH, which is the standard measure. This shows ocean deoxygenation, um, two sources here. The long-term one here from 1900 to 2015 clearly shows, clearly shows accelerating deoxygenation. This is a short term from 1950 up to 2015. They're both up to 2015. This one is from the IPCC, and the purple shows the observed, recorded, measured ocean oxygen, the reduction of ocean oxygen, as a percentage. Uh, the one from 1900 is given as a concentration of oxygen. Clearly, ocean oxygen is decreasing at a rapid rate here, actually uh, beyond the worst case scenario. The ocean oxygen content has declined by 2%. And if you think of the vastness of the oceans, that's a huge difference. And that's happened since the middle of the 20th century, while the volume of ocean waters, completely depleted of oxygen, has quadrupled since the 1960s, increased fourfold since the 1960s. Now to what we usually are used to seeing, which is global warming, the global surface temperature increase. 
the source here is the NASA GISS. And these are the NASA maps. This is 2022, the annual temperature increase. This is the global land ocean average. And above is the land only, which NASA provides. The land ocean increase was 1.14 degrees C from pre-industrial. But the land increase is 1.47 degrees C, nearly 1.5 degrees C. And please note that practically all the increase has come from the northern hemisphere. So here are two records from GISS of the northern hemisphere temperature increase, because the northern hemisphere temperature has been increasing at an accelerated rapid rate ever since 1980. So this is last year's northern hemisphere temperature increase, which is also almost 1.5 degrees C. And it's an accelerated, continual soaring temperature increase. This is the most recent record that we have, which is the record over the winter we're just coming out of, uh, December, January, and February this year. And this is even higher for the northern hemisphere. The increase is 1.64 degrees C. These are the two accelerated annual increases. This is the global and this is the northern hemisphere there for the big difference. And this is the uh, accelerated winter temperature increase. Again, huge difference. Next is the cryosphere, the frozen parts of the planet, the snow and ice parts of planet Earth. These are the polar regions the Arctic uh, climate change indicators above here and below Antarctic climate change indicators. I'm going to start with the Antarctic. The Antarctic uh, is a continent. It's massive, 5.5 million square miles, 14.2 million square kilometers. These are images of the Antarctic sea ice. September here is the maximum sea ice for the Antarctic. A lot of sea ice around there. February is the Antarctic minimum for sea ice, and most of it's melted away. This is the Antarctic sea ice record. It has been tending to increase over the years until just the past few years when it went into a decrease. This March of just gone was a record low for Antarctic sea ice. This is the Antarctic ice sheet. This shows the rapid decline the cumulative mass loss from the ice sheet, which is dropping at an accelerating rate. To the Arctic sea ice, this, these records are from 1980. And uh, you can see here that over those years, the Arctic extent at the Arctic sea ice minimum, which is in September, was in an accelerating trend rate of decline. But over the past few years, it's leveled out. That is, that is predicted, projected by the sea ice models. The uh, thin sea ice, which is practically all the uh, summer Arctic sea ice now, there's different dynamic and feedback, but the Arctic sea ice will all go. This shows a view from above for the extent of the sea ice in September, the uh, minimum again in 1979 and then in September of 2022. And you can see the huge difference. There's almost a 50% loss, 47% loss of sea ice extent over the past 43 years. This is Greenland ice sheet. And again, this is cumulative mass loss, and it shows an accelerating drop in the cumulative loss of mass from the Greenland ice sheet melt. This is the Arctic temperature. Uh, temperature over land from 1850 up to 2020. And this shows the uh, Arctic temperature increased uh, over 3 degrees C. And we know now that the Arctic is heating, the Arctic is heating up three times and more above the global average. Uh, this shows the uh, Arctic sea ice extent 1979 to 2022. Uh, the um, the Arctic, uh, uh, the Arctic sea ice, of course, was absolutely massive, uh, 7.2 million square kilometers in 1979, dropped to 4.9 million square kilometers in 2022. Now, of course, the uh, big crucial importance of that is the uh, sea ice 
albedo feedback, the amplifying feedback of losing sea ice extent, losing the reflective property albedo of the sea ice, which reflects the energy from the solar energy back out to space, and the sea ice that is now missing, so heat energy is, is absorbed into the dark open ocean. And that is why the Arctic temperature is increasing at such an accelerating rate called Arctic amplification. But it's also got catastrophic implications for the carbon store and carbon feedbacks from the Arctic, which we'll be looking at. We are, as I've mentioned, in a situation now of uh, methane feedback emissions. And the feedback emissions are coming from warming wetlands. Wetlands are in the tropics, as shown here, and in the far north. Methane is being emitted as a feedback from both the tropical wetlands and from the northern wetlands. Here we're looking at the Arctic and the wetlands and the other sources of carbon feedback emissions in the Arctic. There are enormous Arctic sources of feedback emissions to global warming in the Arctic. They give rise to multiple inter-reinforcing amplifying feedback loop. We've been aware and worried about this for many decades, and that makes the Arctic a slow-reacting massive carbon bomb. And it is releasing some of that carbon now that has started in the wetlands, as mentioned, and also the thawing permafrost. Permafrost, as it thaws, is actually emitting all three greenhouse gases, methane, carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide. So the Arctic contains a third of the planet's stored soil carbon. So that's why it is a carbon bomb to global surface warming. So the carbon sources are peat-rich wetlands, as mentioned, boreal forest, which is the largest forest carbon store on the planet, permafrost, which holds double atmospheric carbon, and potentially subsea floor methane with respect to the shallow Arctic continental shelves. And we've already mentioned that the uh, loss of sea ice extent and also the decline in the far north snow cover is an amplifying feedback which will drive all these emissions from vast carbon sources harder and faster. And so we are in a dire biosphere emergency, biosphere being all of life on this precious planet. The reason is these multiple record high accelerating climate system change indicator. So this is trending together. These changes are trending to biosphere collapse, and that constitutes an escalating threat to the survival of humanity and most life on Earth. And what the intervention must achieve, we've been told by the IPCC. This is a quote from the IPCC's chair, Hassan Lee, and he stated global warming of 1.5 degrees C and 2 degrees C will be exceeded during this century unless immediate, rapid, large-scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, particularly carbon dioxide and methane, happen. So that must be made to happen. And that means that we need the help from the science academy, from the influential, knowledgeable science academies, an emergency intervention to see this immediate emissions decline so we might be able to secure a livable future. Uh, thank you.